morning. Morning, y'all. I'll give you a good y'all from the south here. <laughs> I remember when I lived in California and I realized how much I said that word, y'all, and trying to figure out, like, do I keep using that word? And then when I decided to try to not use it, I didn't know what other word to use in place. I think some of my southern friends can relate. Like, we use that word a lot. You all, y'all, all y'all. <laughs> anyway, I am definitely a southern girl. All right. Um, we are going to talk about, continue talking about the identity that we have in our Father this week as ones who are full of peace. And it's not just a peace that we muster up because we, you know, do use our tools and all that. Yes to all of that. But there is a peace that is accessible to us that is actually the same peace that Jesus walked in when he was here. And he told us, my peace I give you, not as the world gives you. And um, that peace we've been talking about, one of the definitions in the Hebrew in the Old Testament is shalom. And what a powerful word that is. So today I want to highlight um, a particular verse, Romans 14, verse 7. And it's the one that you've probably heard a lot of times. The kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. I want to give it to you in the context of what they were actually, excuse me just a second, what they were actually talking about when Jesus said that. No, it wasn't Jesus that said it. We're in Romans. It was Paul that said it. Um, Romans 14, verse 7. Um, I think my sister Missy might have talked to you about this. Um, but basically in this chapter, Paul is contrasting the law with grace and with freedom and liberty. And he is trying to give them some really practical advice because for them at the time, there was so much law that they that especially the Jews had grown up with, the, the Israelites, the Jewish people. And then all, obviously the people around them were watching them try to adhere to all of these strict rules, what they could eat, what they couldn't eat, uh, when they could do what. And um, so let's see where I want to start with. Verse 14, I'll just start there, Romans 14, 14. I know and am convinced by the Lord Jesus that there is nothing unclean of itself. He's speaking specifically of food, I, I believe. But to him who considers anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. Yet if your brother is grieved because of your food, you are no longer walking in love. Do not destroy with your food the one for whom Christ died. Therefore, do not let your good be spoken of as evil. And then he goes on to say the part that I'll highlight in a second. But my understanding of the heart that Paul was trying to communicate there is that what, what Jesus had, had revealed to him was that, um, yeah, we are free from the law that says we have to eat or not eat a certain food or thing. And he said, but um, if you're if you're using that to cause offense to someone else, like we're good, so don't let your good be spoken of as evil. Don't get a bad reputation because you're so adamant about your freedom or you're so adamant about, um, you know, your conviction to not eat something on either side of it. And I think this applies to us today even related to food and related to fasting, related to the disciplines around um, how and what we eat. And, you know, the reality is, is each of us has um, our own hearing through the Holy Spirit. And I believe that Jesus, and Paul was picking up on this, is that Jesus is very protective over each of our 
individual um, places of conviction with the Holy Spirit. And he's more concerned about us learning to walk with the Holy Spirit and discern and obey what he's telling us and then walking that out in front of other people in a way that um, to the best of our ability doesn't offend others. And so I think, you know, a good example of that could be like um, whether you drink or not alcohol. So drinking alcohol for one person might literally be an issue of life or death because they've struggled with alcoholism. For someone else, it might be a conviction that they have that they're not, they feel, they do not feel freedom from the Lord and their relationship with him to drink alcohol. For another, they might feel totally free to have alcohol um, within certain boundaries. So that's something that we, should, we need to be, what I would say, socially aware of. What the people that you're around, the people that you're in relationship with, it's not that you want to hide whether you do it or not. It's about being sensitive to other people and where they are with that. So I'm not going to flaunt my freedom. If I'm someone who drinks alcohol, I'm not going to flaunt my freedom in front of someone who clearly has a conviction that they shouldn't. You know, why would I go to their home? If they invite me over and just start, you know, bring my own booze and just drink it up in front of them, right? You know, I'm, I'm exaggerating, being a little silly, but I'm trying to make the point here and make it somewhat applicable for today. So I didn't want to take the next part out of context. So that's the context in which Paul is saying the next thing, which is, For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. For he who serves Christ in these things is acceptable to God and approved by men. All right, so the kingdom of God, what's, you know, the kingdom, woo it's not this just hyper-spiritual thing. The kingdom is, the way that I see it, is it is God's better way of doing everything. It's the king's domain. It's how God rules. It's his understanding of the way things work best. And, of course, that's how he does things. He governs. He teaches. He is... Um, a father, he is a provider, the best way that it can be done. And he models for us from heaven his better ways of doing all of these things. So your kingdom come on earth just like it is in heaven. Your better ways that exist and operate and function in heaven here on earth. That's our goal. And why do we care about getting the kingdom of heaven on earth? Because it's all about, I'm a broken record here, but it's all about the knowledge of God. We want everyone to have access to what God's really like and his heart for us. And you can see what God is really like and his heart for us when you see the way he rules and reigns. The practical outworking of how, how does he do government? How does he do education? How does he do an economic system? So, um, the kingdom of God, so his ways of doing things, his better ways of doing everything, is not about eating and drinking. It's not about rules and regulations. It's not about fulfilling um, certain, you know, our ways of doing things. And it's, it's man that puts into place these rules and regulations. Like, if you eat pork, then God cannot approve of you. You know, um, that was literally their mentality then and for some now. And it's, it's a, he's, he's contrasting it to, it's, it's not about what you eat and drink. It's about the relationship behind it. It's about the obedience. It's about the conviction. It's about the nuances of how you live that out around the people that you're called to love. And then he goes on to say, but what the kingdom of God is, it's righteousness, it's peace, and it's joy in the Holy Spirit. 
So righteousness, um, when I delve, dove into those three words a little bit more, righteousness is integrity, virtue, correctness of thinking, feeling, and acting, and right standing with God. So righteousness obviously is something that has been a gift from Jesus to us. We couldn't have our own righteousness. It's never good enough. We can never be perfect enough to compare to the holiness of God. So Jesus literally um, paid the price for us to have his perfection, his righteousness. So, um, but it, it is also what, something that we grow up into. So we don't like just totally receive the righteousness of Christ and then we never work on our own character. We never partner with the Holy Spirit to grow up you know, and become like Christ. So he gives us the free pass of righteousness, and then he says, now grow up into it. So we grow up into that place where we, we automatically have right standing with God through Christ, but we learn to correct, to think, feel, and act correctly. And that's all summed up in that word righteousness. So the kingdom of God is about righteousness. And the kingdom of God is about peace. So this is the week that we're focused on peace, which is why I grabbed this scripture to talk about today. Remember, it's that shalom. It's that place of abiding. It's, um, it's not living internally in a place of chaos. It's living internally, despite whatever's happening on the outside around us. It's that, um, that rest, tranquility, Harmony, harmony is that place of unity where we, we walk in unity with each other and unity with him. It doesn't mean we agree on everything with other people. It means we still choose relationship. And it's, it's um, an assurance of salvation. So there's an assurance that we were meant to live and abide in as we stay abiding in the Holy Spirit, an assurance of our eternal position with God. And that gives us ultimately the backdrop for all peace. Because worst case scenario, I am good with him for the rest of eternity. Like it, 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 even if things were to go horribly wrong on this side, I am with him for eternity. That's meant to, to give us a solid place to stand on to um, live in peace, in harmony with him and with others. And it also, when you think of things in the context of eternity, it keeps them the size they need to be. You know, you can have to talk something through with another person and not disconnect from them and not have disunity. Um, you know, that word peace, part of it is harmony. You can not... Um, undermine that harmony when you realize, okay, we're going to talk something through. We may agree to disagree, but in light of eternity, this is really not a big deal. So peace is connected to all of that. And the kingdom of God is also joy. Joy is cheerfulness. I love this, this one, calm delight. You know how you think of somebody who's really angry and they just sit and they just stew and brew? You can do the opposite. You can actually sit and just have this constant rumble in the background of just sheer delight. Like I'm just, I have so much joy. It doesn't mean I'm telling jokes. It doesn't mean I'm, you know, got a silly grin on my face all the time. It could mean that. But it means that there's just this calm delight. And delight I think is a nuanced version of like happiness because delight kind of crosses over into the side of the ability to enjoy something or someone. So a calm ability to enjoy. You know, you take delight in something and you know that you are delighted in. That's that place of joy that the kingdom, God's better ways, offers us. So God's better, better ways offer us righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. 
So obviously, the key to, the, to accessing the righteousness, the peace, and the joy, the key to accessing what we already know the kingdom is about is abiding in with Holy Spirit. And just continuing every day that connection with the Holy Spirit, not grieving the Holy Spirit, listening closely, partnering with wisdom, partnering with, um, you know, just you partner with, when you partner with someone, you, you continue to get their input. You continue to want their opinion. You continue to defer to them when, um, when you should, which is obviously the Holy Spirit would be all the time. So, kingdom of God, righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. All right, um, gonna read a short section here. In Rainbow God, the seven colors of love. And we're on page 187. We are focused this whole month on the face of God as provider and the face of God as provider on the mountain of economy and his generosity towards us. Uh, so we learned that the one simple lie that continues to be perpetuated ultimately about God that tries to exalt itself against the knowledge of God is that it is pointless to trust God for resources. So what is the truth? What is the truth we're called to display in this area of culture? And what is the truth that in an ideal world, we were meant to experience and be assured of as it relates to God? So the truth, God enjoys providing for us and through us. Uh, this whole section is me speaking. A few years ago, we went to see the Broadway production of Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat. Technicolor Dreamcoat. The musical based on the biblical account of Joseph. For those who aren't, oh, aren't very familiar with the Bible, sorry, I think I just found a typo. I need to, no, it's not a typo. Okay. You find these things when you write and then you try to fix them for the next time that you print the book. Anyway. The musical based on the biblical account of Joseph. For those who aren't very familiar with the Bible, this is not the same Joseph who was married to the mother of Jesus. This Joseph lived many generations before that and went through years of betrayal, slavery, false accusation, and imprisonment as a process of preparation to partner with God in saving the people of Egypt from starvation during a seven-year famine. It's quite a story in many ways, but my favorite thing about this historical account is what it tells us about God. He truly desires to show us what he's like and how much he cares about us if we care enough to perceive it. Joseph, Joseph's father gave him a coat of many colors when he was a boy, and that made his brothers very jealous. Evidently, this coat was valuable because of the many colors. Joseph's brothers then threw him into a pit and sold him as a slave. I didn't mention in here for time's sake, but obviously they were also jealous of him because he got a dream from God that one day they would bow down to him. And he very excitedly shared this with his brothers. And of course, they didn't like that idea. Joseph's brothers then threw him into a pit and sold him as a slave. His master, whom he had served faithfully, then ended up imprisoning him on false charges. While in prison, he served other prisoners by using his relationship with God to help them with issues of the heart and interpreting their dreams. <laughs> it's funny, the very thing that got him into trouble in the first place, having a dream and sharing it in a maybe unwise way, now, years later, God is using it to uh, advance him. I never thought of that before. When the Pharaoh of Egypt had a dream that was clearly important but couldn't understand its meaning, he heard of Joseph and called him out of prison to interpret the dream for him. Not only was Joseph able to interpret the dream, 
He also knew the heart of God well enough to understand what God wanted to do about the bad news of the famine so all would be saved and even prosper through it. The best part of the story is that God cared so much about the people that he positioned one of his sons to be ready to help when they needed it most. He also made sure that when Joseph came to the rescue, he was able to handle the favor and not let it ruin him internally. In fact, by the time Joseph went through all he did, he had grown to the point of being able to forgive and save the very brothers who had betrayed him. God the provider was able to use Joseph to display his love for the people by providing in the midst of potential crisis. Here again, we see God's heart to make himself known. God could have just stopped the famine, but he preferred to use it to show his care and desire to provide for them, to make himself known. Does Joseph's process sound familiar to your own journey? If so, you'll get a lot out of Johnny's previous book, The Seven Mountain Mantle, Receiving the Joseph Anointing for Reforming Nations. In the same way that Joseph received a mantle of seven colors of favor, each of us is also given a responsibility and privilege of favor to impact the seven areas of culture that need the redemption of God's love. We too must go through a process that prepares us to be able to access God's supernatural solutions for the crisis of our day so the authority we function in will not harm us or the people God will position us to serve. What more honored assignment could we have than to experience God's provision for ourselves while he uses us to provide for others? We will do this for the sake of his name and fame as the God who loves to provide the riches of his love for the nations of the earth. How they will rejoice when they see the truth that God enjoys providing for us and through us. I love that. So, um, you know, something else about that story related to Joseph is that, you know, Joseph went through so much process in his lifetime that allowed him um, to still have his relationship with God intact when it came time for him to partner with God in the area of life culture that he was called to partner with God in. Um, if you've heard me say this before, I'm going to say it again that, you know, Joseph, any of us going through what he went through, it would be very tempting in that moment to, yeah, okay, I can interpret the dream and here's what it means you we're you know this is a problem you're gonna go through a lot of problems right now there's famine coming but it didn't stop there he literally knew the heart of God was to care even though he went through circumstances in his personal life that tempted him to believe that God doesn't really care about him so he he obviously had wrestled that through with God, even in prison, being falsely accused and put in prison unfairly. And he shows up interpreting the dream, still believing that God cares. And then willing to be a conduit for what God wanted to provide for them, a solution. And super practical, here's what we need to do. So. I believe he's such a prototype of what it looks like to go through process in our lives and all the difficult, unjust, you know, things, the dysfunction that we, we get raised in, etc. And then we come out of it still knowing that God is good and he cares. Then we're able to properly represent him to others in the positions of influence that he puts us in. We can care about what he cares about, notice that he cares, notice that he has a solution, use our intimacy with him to receive that wisdom and supernatural solution from heaven, and then have strategy to actually maybe go another step and implement 
the reality that he cares. So this is who our God is as provider. He can see what is coming even when we can't. And he can position us to be a conduit for his resources in the midst of whatever kind of famine we face in the land. Whether it's a true famine or a famine of peace, a famine of joy, a famine of truth, we can be conduits of those things that, that there is lack of in the natural. Because we are connected to the source of all that is good and all that is right. And that is the face of God, the aspect of him as provider. He's so good. So um, let's see how I want to end this today. Um, I'll go ahead and give you the song. I've only listened to this one time, but it, it just... I had never heard it before. It was such a powerful song, really, really spoke to me. Um, Christine DeMarco, her song is called, I Am No Victim. I Am No Victim. Um, it's, it's, it's a really powerful song. Christine DeMarco, I Am No Victim. So, you know, I just feel to read, um, to declare over you a psalm. So let me grab... I'm going to use a, um, I'm going to use the Passion Translation. And let's see. I, I want to read part of Psalm chapter 7. Actually, yeah, Psalm chapter 7. And I'm going to read that this over um, not just you as an individual, but over, over, uh, how would I say this? It'll make sense when I start reading it. I'll just go, okay? Yahweh, we ask for you to arise in your anger against the anger of our enemies. Awaken your fury and stand up for us. Execute the judgment you have decreed against them. All of us gather around you. And we ask that you would return to your rightful place on high to preside over the enemy. You are Yahweh who judges the people. Vindicate us publicly, Yahweh, and restore our honor and integrity. Declare us innocent. Once and for all, bring to an end the evil tactics of the wicked. Establish the cause of the righteous, for you are the righteous God, the one who searches souls, who tests every heart, to examine the thoughts and motives. God, your wraparound presence is our shield. You're, you bring victory to all who are pure in heart. God, your righteousness is revealed when you judge because of the strength of your forgiveness. Your anger does not break out every day. Yet if anyone repents, you won't relent to sharpen your shining sword. You have an arsenal of lethal weapons that you've prepared for the enemy. You have bent and strung your bow, making your judgment arrows shafts of burning fire. Look how the wicked conceive their evil schemes. They go into labor with their lies and they give birth to trouble. They dig a pit for others to fall into, not knowing that they will be the very ones who will fall into it. Every pit digger who works to trap and harm others will be trapped by their own treachery. But we will give thanks to you, Yahweh, for you make everything right in the end. And we will sing our highest praises to the God of the highest place. 
Amen. We declare it. God, thank you that you are working in ways that we can't even see right now. And you always get the last word concerning your beloved. And we just think right now, God, of all those who have been um, abused by the enemy and taken advantage of and unjustly um, treated in, from censorship to human trafficking, all of these things that are coming to light right now in our generation that you have known about, we come into agreement with your ability to rightly judge and to deal with evil. And we run into your courtroom, your place of justice, your place of setting things right, your place of hearing the cries of those who have been victimized, who have been, um, who have been, uh, at the receiving end of pure evil. And God, this is something that is so much bigger than us, but we align our, our hearts and our um, perspective with yours. Teach us your ways concerning evil, concerning the truly wicked. And we do choose love, God, and we know that, that you are love. And that you are the only one who knows all, sees all, and you are the righteous judge. So we, that we declare that today. We um, partner with that today. Teach us your ways. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Papa. And again, we thank you for this peace that you have left for us, Jesus. We pick it on and we pick it up and we wear it. We put it on ourselves like a garment. We clothe ourselves in your peace, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. Alrighty then. Have an amazing rest of your day. I think I need a little cup of coffee. I'm feeling a little too much peace right now. Um, nah, it's never, never too much peace, right? But um, yeah, cup of coffee. Love you guys, and I will be back here with you tomorrow.